You're watching the estate planning series, Is It Too Late?, with Olivia Smith, co-founder of the SR Law Group. My name is Olivia Smith, and I am going to introduce Ms. Tisha Curry. She began her real estate career in new home sales and has expanded her business to focus on assisting home sellers. Tisha has made a high level commitment to her real estate education, having been mentored and coached by several of the most highly acclaimed in real estate industry. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in sociology from Western Michigan University, a Master of Science degree in administration from Central Michigan University, and a Master of Science degree in real estate from Georgia State University. This multi-million dollar sales agent is a certified new homes professional, the military relocation professional designation. Tisha is a past member of the Douglas County Board of Tax Assessors. She's a real estate coach to top producing realtors and teaches real estate principals at Georgia State University Robinson College of Business. Tisha has a special interest in military families. She she is certified as a peer mentor with the Wounded Warrior Project and volunteered as an instructor with the Army Community Service Program. In her spare time, she enjoys entertaining at home with friends, live music, line dancing, and traveling. Tisha is a former teenage mom who believes through faith and hard work, the only limit to your potential is your own limiting beliefs. And I, I saw some of that line dancing in a recent... <laughs> the recent <laughs> post. I said, okay, get it. You can actually be best fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be introducing our gerontologist extraordinaire, Ms. Gina McKnight from Graceful Living. Gina is a committed service oriented professional who has aligned both her direct patient care personal life experiences, as well as professional business experiences into a company that serves aging adults and their loved ones through their golden years, Graceful Living. Through her caregiver training, advocacy, and education on senior resources, Ms. McKnight aims to empower care partners with the tools that they need to bridge the gap in healthcare services. Her client-centered approach is focused on one goal, to improve or maintain an individual's quality of life so they're able to age gracefully with both dignity and comfort. Respectively, Graceful Living's core values are to serve first with compassion, respect, and gratitude. In addition to caregiver training and advocacy, Ms. McKnight has worked in the field of advertising and marketing, business development for corporations such as Essence and Ebony Magazines, Universal Health Services, and Wellstar Health Systems. She has earned a Master's of Science in Applied Gerontology from Brunel University and a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Mass Communications from the University of South Carolina and has been a licensed realtor since 2006. She currently resides in East Point where she serves as the Vice Chair Planning and Zoning Commission Board as well as an active member of Kiwanis Club of South Cobb. In her spare time, she enjoys expressing her creativity through music and the arts, along with spending time with friends, family, and her fur baby, Chewy. Chewy! <laughs> Thank you so much, Tisha. <laughs> I have the pleasure of introducing to everyone our presenter for this evening, Miss Olivia Smith. Uh, she is a Georgia native and a graduate of Spelman College, which received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Political Science. She's also a graduate of Loyola University, New Orleans College of Law. Olivia has been practicing law for 14 years, starting out in criminal defense, but, um, <clears throat> but transitioned into estate planning, elder law, and probate as a result of a personal family experience. She is the owner and partner of SR Law Group, a boutique law firm that focuses on estate planning, elder law, and probate in the Black community. She is also the co-host of Black Parents Aging, a podcast that helps children of aging parents navigate the changing landscape. Olivia is a very active and engaged in her church and community 
She serves as the probate and estates chair for the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys and on the advisory board of Changing How Individuals Prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Olivia Smith. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right in. Um, and as Tisha said at the beginning, as I go through this PowerPoint, this presentation, if you have questions, please put them in the chat because we want to make sure we address all of them. And so the title of this presentation is, Is It Too Late? Um, is why you should make sure you do your planning now, why you should not wait. And so we're going to start with when is it too late? Because there is a a point where planning kind of goes out of the door. And the first part is incapacity. Um, there are calls we get every week from people that want to plan on behalf of a loved one or a loved one has expressed an interest in doing some planning. And as we gather more information, we realize that that person does not have the capacity to plan um, that maybe they have Alzheimer's, maybe they have dementia, and maybe it's progressed to the point where I can't rely that they understand what they're doing as far as planning, that they understand kind of what they own and who they will be putting into those um, polite positions. And so at that point, I cannot do estate planning for them. And so they've kind of reached the threshold where planning is no longer an option for them. And then the other part is death, right? So, you know, if you haven't planned before these two points, you are kind of left with whatever the event decides is to happen with you or your things. Um, and that is usually a one size fits all. I had, was it this week? I think it was last week, a couple come to me um, the husband had just been diagnosed with dementia. And so they'd come to do their planning, but they didn't have the sense of urgency I had with hearing he had been diagnosed with dementia. Um, and they were like, well, let's talk about it. We'll call you back. But that is the absolute perfect time to get it done. Um, you know, uh, um, your spouse has been diagnosed with dementia, but they are still of sound mind and they can still make those decisions for your, themselves. And so um, making sure that you get your planning done so they can have their say while they um, have capacity. So this is when it's too late. No need to call my office. I can't do anything for you. And so what are the things that we are trying to prevent by doing planning? So there are five reasons, and I'm sure other people could come up with more, but these are five reasons that I've kind of pinpointed that make it important to plan now. The first is to consider avoiding probate. The second one is avoiding heirs property issues. The third is preventing someone having to get guardianship for you. The fourth one is someone having to get conservatorship for you. And then the fifth one is someone else, a court, deciding who is going to be the guardian of any minor children that you are responsible for. And so these, I think, are five very good reasons that you should not wait to plan. Mm -hmm. so gonna, and so we're going to get into each one of these in kind. And then at the end, if you have any questions, please let me know. So avoiding probate. So clients come to me to do planning specifically sometimes because they do not want their family members having to go through the probate process. Um, it can be expensive, it can be time consuming, and if you don't know the process, it can be complicated. And so, if there is a way to avoid having to jump through this hurdle, um, that is something you should consider. In Georgia, depending, it, it really 
she is from county to county, probate court to probate court, when you're looking at how long does it take, you know, an estate to go all the way through the process? How long should we be looking at? And when people ask me that when we're doing their probate work, it's really hard to tell them. Um, it depends on the county, it depends on the season, it depends on what else is coming through probate court. And so in a lot of ways, when you don't avoid probate court, you're at the mercy of probate court. Um, and so that is one thing to consider. And when you, when you think about avoiding probate court, there are other things that you can be doing to make sure or that your estate does not fall into probate court. For instance, making sure that all of your beneficiary designations are up to date. Um, if you have a life insurance policy and your beneficiary has predeceased you and there is no backup, the backup is usually it goes into the day. So if you have done your trust planning and you figured out how to avoid probate, but you have this one thing that you have not updated, that can fall into the estate and you wind up having to open up probate court. Oftentimes people call because per person, their loved one not home, right? But they had bank accounts and they were the sole person on the bank accounts. And where I, whereas I don't advise you to add owners, co-owners on bank accounts for all sorts of reasons, what you can do is add a pay on death or transfer on death beneficiary on bank accounts. Because when you or your loved one passes, the bank is gonna lock that account because they don't know who's supposed to have access and they don't wanna do the wrong thing. And so they're gonna tell you they're, going to wait for some sort of court order before they're going to give access to those accounts. But if you have a pay on death or transfer on death beneficiary, it pays directly out to that person and you avoid having to go to probate court. So these are some ways that you can avoid probate court. And then of course, if you're doing your planning, doing trust-based planning versus will-based planning will help you you to avoid probate. So avoiding probate, that is number one. Number two is heirs property. So we hear a lot about families where there are one million people that own one single piece of land. Um, maybe not a million, but definitely like, like 20, sometimes 50 um, people that may own just a couple of acres. And you think, okay, how did that happen? It can be created by a will. It can also be created by not doing planning. And so when you are doing planning, it is important to do effective planning. And oftentimes you say, I want all of my property, I want my property or the house to go all to all 10 of my kids equally. That may not be effective planning. And so we wanna make sure that we're thoughtful in the type of planning we do um, because, you know, the whole point of planning is things easier and less complicated. And if our plan makes it more complicated and more likely that there's going to be some, some family feuds, then we aren't doing a good job. If we don't do any planning at all, what the government says is, if you pass and you have a spouse and children, it's split between them. If you have children, no spouse, it's split between your children. And so that can set up an heir's property situation. If there are generations of people who don't do planning, then your children, and has children and then it's split between all the grandchildren and the grandchildren have children and split between all the great grandchildren and it keeps going and that's how you wind up with 50 people owning one piece of property and so if there is a way to avoid that um we certainly want to what are some of the issues that happen with there being a property one of it is co-owners have equal rights to the property so, you know, you may have one person that wants to live in the property, right? And they like, well, I'm just as much an owner as everybody else. So you can't really evict that person. 
co-owners can sell part of their property. So sometimes, you know, a, a co-owner will say, I don't really want to be a part of this anymore. I'm going to sell my 150th for however much someone would pay for it. And so then you have a non-family member that enters the equation as a co-owner. Um, certain actions such as selling the property requires owners to agree. Selling the property requires owners to agree. Keeping the property requires owners to agree. And when it's that many people in the mix, it's really difficult to get everyone agreeing and on the same page as to what is to be done with this piece of property. And there's always that one responsible person. And they're like, look, I'm paying the taxes on this property every year. We got 50 owners, but nobody kicks in on these property tax every year. And they get frustrated and upset, but they don't want the property to be lost. Their responsible person keeps paying while everyone else is enjoying the benefit of being a co-owner. And so that's number five. Everyone is not going to equally shoulder the weight. And that is a challenge when you have an heirs property situation. So we avoiding probate is one property trying to avoid that is two number three is guardianship so um i have a guardianship a contested <laughs> guardianship that i am going into year three of um and those people though my clients and clients on the other side have a substantial amount of money to fight over who is going to take care of dad and if dad had done planning, dad has dementia. If dad had done planning before his dementia progressed to the point that he couldn't make decisions, we would have been able to avoid a guardianship because we would have a healthcare directive and a power of attorney in place. A guardianship is when you have an incapacitated loved one that get to the point where they cannot make decisions for themselves and because there are no documents in place, what happens is we have to ask the court. We have to ask the court to appoint someone to step into the loved one's shoes and to make decisions on their behalf. And so that's decisions like, where is this person gonna live? And healthcare decisions. And it, it requires there's a hearing and it can get very contested and it can take a lot of time and a lot of money. Whereas if planning had been done and the proper documents were in place, we would not need to ask for a guardianship. So guardianship is number three. The companion to that is number four, which is conservatorship. As I go to each page, I'm like, did I spell that right? Yes. So the number four is conservatorship, preventing the need for conservatorship. A conservatorship is when you have an incapacitated loved one and they're not able to make financial decisions for themselves. So maybe you notice, you know, maybe they have dementia or they're just, they're having, they're just getting older and you notice, okay, bills are falling behind or rent or mortgage isn't getting paid and things aren't getting paid on time and things aren't getting taken care of. Or what we see a lot is people trick them out of their money. I mean, they fall for scams and wind up giving their money away to people because, you know, their ability to really understand and decipher is not the strongest. And so you may need a conservatorship to protect them from other, other people who want to take their money. Um, we had a, a case not too long ago where this very nice older lady, um, her, her children brought her in because she had given all of her money to this man. Um, who had contacted her online, who I don't, she thought she was in a relationship with. He was telling her, oh, he just needed her to help her him with this. And she would just send him money. Um, and she had almost gone bankrupt 
because she was sending him money um, and she was believing the ridiculous stories he was telling her about why he needed the money. And so at that point, that may be a sign that, hey, somebody needs to step in and kind of handle the finances for this person. Um, but because we don't have documents in place, we have to ask the court. And so anytime we have to ask the court, it's going to cost money and time. And so preventing the need for a conservatorship is why we do planning. A power of attorney will prevent the need for having a conservatorship. And then the last reason of my five is if you have a minor, um, you deciding who you would want to take care of your child if you couldn't versus the court making that decision because you haven't put the proper documents in place. One of the things that I, when I have parents, parents of minor. That is the biggest um, thing that when we are doing their planning that we're, that they are anxious about and that requires a lot of thought and consideration on their part. That is probably the hardest part of planning for parents that have minors. Um, and, and it's just as much as they say, okay, we want this person. If, you know, something happens to us, we want this person to step in our shoes and care for our child. They oftentimes feel even stronger about under no circumstances do we want this person to ever be the one raising our child. But if you haven't done your planning, the court's not gonna know that. Um, and oftentimes with guardians, with probate with agents that care for you when you are um, ailing and can't take care of yourself, the very person that you would not, not want to inherit everything you have, the very person that you would not want um, caring for you if you couldn't care for yourself, the very person that you would not want to be the guardian for your children is the person that winds up in that position because you haven't done your planning and made that, that clear. And so when the court is making these decisions, it's a one size fits all because they don't know the dynamics of your family. They don't know the family history. They don't know who to like each other. They don't know what happened when you were a teenager with this person and you don't, like they don't know any of that. And so, and they're, so they're making decisions really kind of blindly. And you don't want to leave your fate into, you know, in the hands of the court when you have adequate time to be able to make those decisions for yourself and have your say. And so that's really what this is about. These are reasons you should have your say because nobody knows your wishes better than you and nobody knows your family better than you know them. And that is it. I, I am open to questions, um, but that is that's that's all for my presentation. I'm looking to see Miss Olivia. Okay. Uh, there. Are, okay, we do have a question. Love questions. I think. Uh oh. I think. Hold on. Does parent does the parents will has heirs property? No one can sell property without everyone agree. Several attempts to put the property in a trust, but some co co owners don't agree. Can two of the three executors petition the court to put land in a trust? Well, you when there there are co that don't agree, you can petition the court for a sale depending on the um depending on the size of the property you can petition the court to parcel it out um to each person so that everyone doesn't own the whole i i, I heard or known of a situation where the court has been petitioned to force someone to put it in a trust so I'm not saying it can't be done. I just don't know of 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 an instance where that has happened. 
Okay, next question. What is step one to get started? Step one to get started with your planning? With estate planning, yes ma'am, I'm assuming. Yeah, call. Call, call a law office and, and and set up an appointment. Because quite honestly, and I don't say that to be funny, when you call, for instance, when you call our office, we're gonna say, we're, you're gonna get set up, you're, we charge a consult fee, you're gonna get set up with a consultation day and time. And then the next thing is we're gonna say, hey, here's a questionnaire we need you to figure out. And then that questionnaire is gonna guide you through what we need to know. We need to know who who is your family, who would want to, you know, potentially be a beneficiary. What are your assets? What are your debts? Um, so that questionnaire is going to guide you through the process of what we need to know so that we're prepared uh, on the day of the consult to have a fruitful conversation with you about what your needs are and what you want. Okay, next question. How does estate planning work if you're married? Will each spouse do their own separate estate plan? Yeah, so it depends on the situation of the couple. We have people that come that are married that do their um, planning separately because their spouse may not want to or they don't think it's important and they want their, um, they want to make sure their planning is done. And then we have spouses that come together and want to do it, do it together. When when you come with your spouse, though, you have to sign a waiver because if we're representing both of you, that means we don't keep secrets. So, you know, if we're representing both of you as a married couple, then when you leave, you can't call and be like, OK, I don't want my husband to know about this. But then I can't represent you, y'all. You need two separate attorneys. Um, so you you sign a waiver that we can speak freely in front of, the three of us can speak freely about what each of you want. So it depends on the nature of your marriage. If that's not something you are comfortable with, you should probably do your own estate planning separate from your spouse. Also, <laughs> if you're in a blended family, um, it may be important for you to do your estate planning even if your spouse doesn't because if you have children that are not your spouses you want to make sure that you're providing for those children and so that may require you to do um, your, your planning even if your spouse doesn't want to i often say that it also depends on what time in your life you got married like whether it makes sense to do it together or makes sense to do it or whether you can do it separately if you got married later in life and you got children and he's got children and you don't own really anything together and you kind of built your wealth or your assets up on your own and he did the same and you kind of have everything separate then it may not make as much sense to do it together you each should do it, but it may not make as much sense to, to do it together. If you got married when you were, you know, 19, 20, and now you're 50 or 60, and you've kind of come into all of your assets together, and your name is together on everything, you got bank accounts where both of your name is on, you know, is both of your name, your house, and you kind of share everything, then it would make more sense. Um, and you share all of the same children, then it may, more, may make more sense for you to do your planning together. Thank you, Ms. Olivia. Next question. Please explain again why there should not be two names on a bank account. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Explain okay. that again. So if I have a bank account um, and it's all my, all my money's in it, right? But I'm like, okay, but you know, there may come a time when someone else needs to access my bank account. Let me just put Tisha on my bank account because none of this is her money in here, but I want to make sure that like, if she needs access, it's not going to be an issue. And so my name's on as an owner, Tisha's name is on as an owner. And then Tisha is, you know, get sued and she loses the case and then they're figuring out okay how can we collect and then they run their search and they say oh she 
You got a bank account, right? They're not gonna hear, oh, I, we just put Tisha's name on there so she can have access. She is a co-owner. So when you are the co-owner of the account, you are assumed to have money in that account. Um, or Tisha gets divorced and they're parceling out their assets. You are co-owner on account. That is part of her asset. And so it opens up liability. It opens up your bank account to whatever is going on or Tisha files for bankruptcy. You know, anything that happens with that co-owner, there is implications for that account. Even though in actuality, none of that money is that person's, they are a co-owner. And so everyone looks at, at that account as partially theirs. Um, and so we want to make sure there are ways to have people on an account. If they're your power of attorney, you can add them as a power of attorney on an account and it'll have, have your name, add them as the power of attorney, but that's different from them being the co-owner. If you were worried about access after you pass away and you don't want them to have, you know, the bank to, to lock the account and you have to go to probate. That's why I suggested the pay on death and transfer on death beneficiaries, because it, then it will pay directly out to those people. But we want to protect what's in that account and we don't want to subject it to, you know, any legal issues that a co-owner might have. Is that the same on personal accounts as well as, as, well as business accounts? I'm not sure about business accounts. Um, whether that would subject, but I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. Cause usually the business account is in the business name. Correct. So I don't, I'm, I'm not sure on that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question. Once you do estate planning, can you change it annually? For example, what if your adult children's lifestyles change and you need to take them off as beneficiaries? That's real. Yeah. So um, your estate planning document should be living, breathing things. They should represent your life. As your life changes and morphs, those documents should change it and more. Just think about, if you do your planning when your kids are minors and now they're all adults, the, those needs and who gets what will change. And so you need to update. You get divorced, that needs to change both your estate planning and your life insurance policy and beneficiary designations. If you have a falling out with someone, it may need to change. If someone predeceases you that you've listed, it may need to change. So depending on when you do your planning, they may, may be several different iterations of those documents, um, depending on what's going on in your life. Thank you. Now, before we go to the next question, I want to remind or or let our, our um, our audience know that we have a survey in the chat for you. We are uh, always collaborating on what the next topic should be. This is our sixth installment of the estate planning series. So we'd like your feedback on how we've done today as far as answering your questions and what other topics you'd like to see covered. So that feedback form is in the chat. So if you would do us a favor and just give us some feedback about your experience with us today and what you'd like for us to cover moving forward. Okay, next question. If yes. someone passes away while going through a divorce, is the spouse the legal beneficiary or the named individual per the living will? Is the spouse the legal beneficiary or the per so the person had a will and they listed um, who they wanted, which wasn't the spouse. Okay, so this is interesting. <laughs> So well, it, it, there's it depends. <laughs> it depends. That's a love that answer. It depends. My it favorite. It depends on where they were in the divorce. Okay, I had a case where they had like gone and talked to an attorney. Nothing had really been filed, um, and the spouse got every got everything. The spouse got it, that share. If there is a will, then. Um, 
those benefits, you cannot um, disinherit a spouse in Georgia. A spouse is entitled to at least a third, depending on, um, you know, if there are children, if there are multiple children, a spouse is entitled to at least a third. And so um, if you have a will that different your spouse, it, a spouse is going to ask for their share and they're going to get it. So I I'll just, had, oh, go ahead, you go ahead. I had a, a case, a current case where there was a will, the person, um, when they, they drafted their will, they were not married. They have a brother and sister. They split everything they have between their two siblings. Subsequent to that, they got married um, from someone that don't live in this country and that they didn't live with. Um, and they had only been married to for like, and my clients were hesitant to tell me. They were like, well, you know, we don't, we're not really sure if they are really married, whatever. They were really married. Georgia law says if you had not anticipated, if in the will you had anticipated being married and said, no, I, I'll still get to go to my siblings. If you get married subsequently, that spouse, she took everything. She gets it all. Um, because Georgia law says that if you get married subsequently to having a will and it is not anticipated in the will that you are going to be married, then it is as if you, for that part, for the inherited part, as if you died intestate without a will. That your spouse takes whatever they would take if you died without a will. And in this case, they had no children. So it disinherited my clients, which was a brother and sister, and the spouse took 100% of the estate. And that was a really tough pill to swallow because he done it, he done the estate plan 20 years ago and he got married in the last two years. And those two, and that is why it is important to update your plan and your document as your life changes. He didn't. Um, and that was really hard for my clients to sit by and watch someone they didn't really know, someone he'd only been married to for a year, someone who never even made it to this country, take everything. So the flip side of that is if a husband and wife are going through a divorce, the divorce is not final. Yeah. The spouse, uh, the spouse changes beneficiaries in the middle of the divorce process, but the divorce isn't final. Who gets the estate? So that is a, I, I'm not sure. I've not okay. had that happen. Happen. I want to say is if you if you have filed because in my case they hadn't filed so we had nothing. I think that would probably be a hearing um, and a judge would decide. But if you are in the if you are in the midst of a divorce where it has already been filed and it is clear that you are um, are divorcing and you changed your beneficiary designations on your will to reflect that, I don't know for sure and I can I can look it up it's, there's probably case law that tells me um, and and s send something out but I'm gonna say it's a pretty good chance that that spouse is or that well, future ex-spouse isn't gonna inherit when you look that up because that might be a situation where that is what's being contested whether or not they can do that right yes Yes, yeah. I will look that up. Okay, good. Good to know. All right. Uh, next question. What is the role of an executor? Let me just, I'm going to make a note. Okay, no problem. Okay, an executor. Executor exists if you have a will. And the executor's job is to handle clearing up the la your lattice. So your executor is the one that's handling the business. So they're the one um, 
selling the selling the house if it needs to be sold. They're the one opening the estate account. Um, they're the one filing your last taxes, your last personal taxes. Um, they're the one paying off the creditors on at the end making the di final distributions to whoever your beneficiaries are. So they are the one that's handling the business of your estate. So that should be someone that is good with that sort of thing, that is organized, responsible, um, and you know, you feel would be a would be good. So part two to that question is, do you have to appoint an executor when you set up the trust? A tr oh, so a trust, you would appoint a trustee, not an okay. executor. Um, and yes, you would need to appoint a trustee because you're going to need, you're the old trustee. But after you are gone, who is going to step in your shoes and continue to handle the, the trust, the business of the trust. You ha would have left a list of instructions and then it would be would be their responsibility to follow those instructions. Um, next question, what are the most common trust accounts? So the most common trust is a revocable trust. It's a revocable living trust it is a trust that allows you to add assets to it as you accumulate more. It allows you to take assets out if you want to sell or do something else with it. It really allows you to act no different than if it were in your name, even though now it is in the trust name. But it is not an asset protection trust. And so it does not protect you from lawsuits or from other, you know, it doesn't protect you from that so but that is the most common a revocable trust okay next question what if you start estate planning and then something happens in the marriage that leads to divorce or separation will the two people be required to sign or relinquish signatures i don't understand what what the i don't understand what that okay so whoever it's our estate planning if you don't finish well, we're going to ask for clarification of the question. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. So one person said their son's father passed. He said he, he said he would be taken care of because he set up something, but I don't know what. Is there some way to find out that info? Um... That's a hard one because we don't know what that something is. If, if um, you know, your son's or your child's father passed, his estate is going to need to be probated. Ideally, that, through that process, you will find out what is out there. Um, there are searches you can do. There are, there are bank account searches and there are life insurance policy searches that you can do but it usually requires approval. So it requires you to have some sort of need to make do those searches. Okay, next question. And, and let me just say, if your son's father passed and nobody is, um, and no one is probating his estate as the other, their parent of a child that is potentially the beneficiary or the heir to his estate, you might be able to open probate on your child's behalf um, because there may be something coming to him. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so this person says, I don't know if I can afford to see an attorney for estate planning. My husband and I don't own much. What is the typical cost? It, that is hard. Um, so I will say usually planning for a will, will planning, will power of attorney, health care directive, usually starts, I would say, 1500 and up. Um, trust planning starts, that's really difficult. Um, because it does depend on your assets. Trust planning is usually more than will planning on the front end. 
If you have to probate on the back end of a will um, and you don't know how to do it, you don't know the process and you hire an attorney and you have to pay the attorney, it's going to be more together. But on the front end, a will is cheaper um, than a trust. On the, a trust, you don't have to probate. Um, so I, a trust is a, on the bottom, like on the low end, a couple thousand dollars for sure. Um, but if you are saying you and your husband don't have a lot, people never think they have a lot. So if you're saying, okay, we don't have a home, a home is usually the biggest asset. You say, okay, we don't have a home, we rent then there are ways to get around needing to plan those beneficiary designations, putting those pay, those beneficiaries on your bank accounts, making sure your life, making sure all of the designations are updated. Um, you may not, everybody doesn't need necessarily the same thing. And so when we say planning, it's not one size fits all. It's not everybody gets a will. After we talk, we may say, okay, you need these life documents. You need a power of attorney. You need a health care directive. You need a HIPAA. Um, and you need to do fiduciary designations and you should be good. So it just depends. Um, I do think everyone needs a power of attorney and a health care directive. If they don't have anything else, those are two documents every single person needs. Those are life documents. Those are documents that okay, go to into effect while you are still here. It also gives your agents the power to do some planning on your behalf if it is needed. And so those are two documents I think everyone needs. All right. So next question, what's the best way to remove folks from your bank accounts without folks getting upset, assuming you don't trust them, especially when you're the only one making deposits? I don't know if there's a, I, you know, you have no control of where the folks gonna get upset. They probably are gonna get upset. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't remove them. Um, you know, some, when you're handling these situations, both when you're having tough conversations with family and you realize, okay, I need to undo something that I have done, um, you have no control over how they're going to react to it. That's what we cue in Gina down there is the gerontologist who kind of does the, you, you know, who mediated with families in these sort of circumstances. That was, a, that was a different one. That was the tough conversations one. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that is a tough conversation. You answered it perfectly because at, at the end of the day, you can't, you have no control over anyone's emotions. But there's ways that you can get around that um, because at the bank, they that person will have to know. You just might have to open up another account. That, <laughs> That's yeah. real. And it's just that simple. Um, and a certain amount of money goes into that account that's actually shared, but you can open up another account. And, um, and now I'm thinking about even with that situation, and Olivia, you touched on something I did not know being married uh that changes things huh on what? how much the person is actually able to uh you know be entitled to if you have um things so i mean at the end of the day one third is one third if you have a separate account or or not well that's why we're here to educate folks on you know <laughs> and that's at least that's right? at least you know in my example the spouse with my client spouse took it all 100% like windfall um you know and that was tough but it's just like that it really highlights the importance of like making sure that your documents stay up to date with your life um and I'll I'll, I'll tell you another example that we've had as client client got divorced been divorced for well two examples client been divorced for years had a life insurance policy never took the ex-spouse off the life insurance policy and passed away and that ex-spouse got a windfall and they were happy to receive it and do you think they gave it back no 
Another thing that happens in our community a lot, people have been married for 40 years and estranged for 35 of those years. Yes. Still married on paper. They live in two separate states, right? Yeah. Like they they got yes. significant others, like they are going on about their life, but they are still married. Yep. And, and one of them had a pension and realized, oh shoot, then my spouse, my spouse is gonna get whatever part of my pension because now we've been married for 40 years because we never took the time to uncouple. We just mm -hmm. stayed coupled and my, you know, doing what we do. Yeah. Those, those things have consequences. And so, you know, we have we really need to think about that. Like if you done with somebody, be done with them all the way. Because mm -hmm. If not, they still, you know, they still are entitled to certain benefits as your spouse, even if y'all ain't seen each other in 30 years. Yes. And happens. Yes. Ain't that a lot. Can you please explain the difference between the co-owner and beneficiary? Sure. So a co-owner um, is just that. They, you're, you're saying that we co-own what is in this account together. Part of it's mine, part of it's theirs, or if, it, if I have everything in here, that's okay. I'm sharing it with this person. We co-own. The beneficiary says, this is my account, Olivia's account. And while Olivia is alive, she's the only person that owns this account. But when Olivia passes, the it's the, it's the same as if it was an insurance policy. What is in this account pays out to whoever I have designated that it is to pay out to. So it pays out in the same way that a life insurance policy would pay out. Okay. Let me see. Can you discuss the pros and cons of a will versus trust? Whew. Okay. Let's see if I, I can do this quickly. Okay. So though there think of them as two paths. A will, a will is cheaper on, cheaper, and the work happens on the back end. Will means there you will go through probate court. Probating a will is a public thing, so people can take a peek and see what's going on in your case. Um, it opens door to it opens the door to people to for family members to object, and it doesn't provide you the same flexibility. If you want to um, shepherd your assets a little bit and don't want it to be a one and done situation where you go through the process, we distribute everything, we're done, we close the um, estate and that's it. A trust is more expensive on the front end and some of the work happens on the front end in that you have to retitle things. So it, it's, it's no longer in Olivia Smith's name, it's in the revocable living trust of Olivia Smith. And because it's not, not in my name, it's in its name, that is what prevents me from having to deal with probate court. Trust planning avoids probate because when you think of probate, it is the process of getting assets out of the name of a deceased person into the name of someone who is still living. When the assets are in the name of the trust, we don't, don't have a niece. Um, so you avoid probate, You it is private, so no one knows what's going on with that trust, but you as the owner, whoever you've identified as your trustees, and then who is going to inherit, it allows you to shepherd, it allows you to, um, um, continue to guide after you pass. It allows you to say, okay, well, they can get this amount at 18. If they go to college, if they don't go to college, they can't get it to 25. They can get this amount at 30. It allows you to guide. Then I want so much put aside for the grandkids. Grandkids can get it. So it allows you the ability to craft your plan in a way um, that you want to instead of a one and done situation. Um, and so those are the biggest differences in, there are a lot of different trusts for a lot of different circumstances. There are irrevocable trusts for certain circumstances. Our special needs trusts for, you know, if you have a loved one that 
has special needs and receives government benefits. So there are a lot of different trusts. Those are the main two differences though between a will planning and trust planning. Okay, next question. What if you have a prenup agreement? The spouse can only get what's in the agreement? Yeah. That's a question mark. Okay. Yes. And I and we and I and um I advise people, look, get a prenup. And your 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 if you have a prenup and you are doing planning, you should let your attorney know that you have a prenup and that should guide how you do your planning as well. So you want those two things to work together. Awesome, thank you. What are the tax implications of not having an, I'm assuming an estate plan? Now, now I'm not a tax person. Now what I can tell you is, <laughs> I, I, I refer you to your financial planner for all tax questions. And I ask you if you want me to have a conversation with your financial planner to say, okay, this is what on the estate planning side, this is what we've come up with. This is what, you know, here are the goals. This is the mechanism and vehicles that we are going to get them to their goals. From a tax perspective, is this good or is there something else we should consider because these have tax implications? Um, and so, you know, but there are tax implications. And I will say that, I, but I, you know, I'm not a tax person, but I'm happy to work with your person. And I think this is a good point to say that you have, a, you should have a team. It just, it shouldn't be just one person. When you think about planning, when you think about aging, when you think about wanting to make sure that you are, you know, taking care of all different, you know, taking care of everything. You want a team of people people that can advise you and that can work together to make sure that you have the best advice and the best plan that works for all different sorts of perspectives and scenarios. Okay, next question. How many states are there where common law is legal? If a person states that uh, a girlfriend is a life partner, is that a legal partner? It is not. Um, that's something else we like. We like to have lady friends and man friends that we didn't have for 20 and 30 years, but they that is not a legal, that is not a legal um, position. That's not a legal name and you will not, we've had a couple of those in the last month that have been really difficult that um, have had a lady friend for like 30, 40 years that that person took care of this person and then they pass and you don't, they don't inherit anything. They're not entitled to oh. anything. That is really difficult. That is a really difficult conversation to have with that person. Um, common law is, is a thing in some states. I can't tell you how many, I think Texas is one and I can only tell you that because we have a case where we were waiting to see if they were going to be acknowledged as common law spouses because it was gonna determine how the distribution was made. They were determined not to be um, common law spouses and so that person did not inherit, but um, I wouldn't leave it. I wouldn't leave that to, Georgia isn't one of those states and I would leave that to chance. All right, so what if you start estate planning and the marriage is strained, how can uh, one begin to get the spouse off the accounts? Um, take take them off, set up separate accounts? I think, I don't know, this is not legal, but I think what Gina said is like, just open up some different accounts and slowly start defunding the ones that are joint accounts. But I don't know that that's a legal answer. And let me just say this, if you are in the middle of a divorce, I'm not a family law attorney, but if you're in the middle of a divorce and they trying to figure out assets, you cannot hide your assets. <laughs> It'll be found anyway. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. They have forensic people that will, find every penny that is in your name. So if you are trying to do it for that reason, don't do that. Um, so if you're in the middle of a divorce, I think the prudent thing for me to tell you is to talk to your family law 
attorney about what is appropriate and what is legal. Because what we don't want to do is advise you to do something that's going to get you in trouble um, in the middle of your divorce. Okay, next question. Is there a statute of limitations on uh, claiming against an estate? Claiming against an estate. Are you saying... Um, like, is there a statute of limitations by which you can make a claim to an estate? Like an objection? No. Well, I don't know. But here's the example <laughs> I would use. Okay. Okay. So, I, you know, I'm going to use the real estate one, right? You uh, were not aware that someone passed. There's some land. The land has been sold. It's been subdivided. And you say, hey, but I still, I didn't get my money. So that would, the way I understand it, maybe, is there is there a time frame by which you have to raise your hand and say, I, I'm entitled to a portion of this yes. estate? And what is yes. that time? Yes. So... Usually, objection period is like 30 days after it, it's filed because the okay. the thing is, when we file a petition, the heirs have to be listed. The heirs have to be listed and they have to publish to say, hey, this person passed, they've opened this estate. If you are an heir, now is the time. Now, I will say that probate has not caught up to the fact that nobody's reading the newspaper like that anymore. Right. Um, but they publish for that reason. And in and, and many cases, that is the time that we found out about children that nobody knew about. Because that is when they file into the case and say, hey, that was my dad too. And I'm entitled to part of whatever he left. Um, and that is the point at which all sorts of chaos ensues. But generally what I have people fall into the estate, say, hey, that was my parent, that was my dad. Then we have to do, we have to stop and we have to do DNA testing. Um, we have to confirm that yes, this was your, your dad, because usually it's the dad. Um, and then we add them on, we have to, to um, take what we file and add, add, have this happen, add, add them on as an heir, um, and then they are notified as a part of the case. I've also had people come to me and say, and it had, it would have been years that like their dad died, that they were estranged from, they didn't really know the estate was being probated. People may or may not have known about them but the estate has been probated. The assets have been distributed. Like, I don't know what the remedy is at that point. Um, and so, and I and I don't know that there is a remedy at that point. And so, you know, I think there is a time by which it's just too, too, too bad. Like you just lost, you lost the opportunity. But usually you are supposed to, have gotten notice and have the uh, have the opportunity to object within 30 days of the filing of the petition. Okay. So next question, what do you advise if you know family members change the will just days prior to someone dying who were not mentally stable? Cool. You gonna have to object to the will. I mean, that's the, I mean, they're, they're going to probate the one object and you're going to object. You're going to say, there's only a few like reasons to object. You're going to say it was fraud. You're going to say the person didn't have capacity or you're going to say there was undue influence or you're going to, yeah, that's fraud with somebody else sign. And you're going to, they're, you're going to have a, a, a trial and the judge is going to decide who, you know, who has the best evidence and, and who they believe. Okay. So I just want to say one more thing. Thank you so much for joining us. Please leave us your feedback. If you found this webinar enjoyable on the survey form, please leave us a testimonial and let folks know um, how your experience was with us. Also, give us an opportunity to answer additional questions for you. Um, let us know what additional topics you would like for us to 
cover moving forward. I want to say an, an amazing thank you to the incredible Olivia Smith Esquire. Oh, thank you. It's unmatched. Thank you to our gerontologist extraordinaire, Miss Olivia Smith. I'm sorry. <laughs> you not gave me another title. Yes, I didn't get her all the jobs. And I'd also like to send a warm shout out to our admin partner who you do not see on the back end that keeps yes. us. But he's an extraordinaire. He's amazing. <laughs> Nia, if you'd like to show your face, we'd like Neil to public. <laughs> I've tried to steal her, uh, Neil away from her. <laughs> you will not really. No, I'm not ready. Sorry. Uh, please him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Olivia, there is a chat for you. Uh, I think that uh, Dr. Mines would like to to chat with you about doing an, an another another event for an organization that she's a part of. Of course, I would love okay. to. Um, and I think that's it. Here, it just email me. Here, my email's here. Yes. So, if you'd like to stay in contact with us, our contact information is here. Uh, if you have real estate related questions, feel free to reach out to me. If you have estate planning questions, reach out to Miss Olivia. If you have uh, gerontology and um, questions regarding caregiving for your family, reach out to Miss Regina. Or if you don't know who to reach out to, reach out to one. <laughs> Get you directly point you in the right, right direction. Right yeah. place. Feel free if you'd like a recording of the webinar, please put that in your survey and we'll get that over to you as well. Let me see. Okay, we got one more question. If we work with okay. you and something happens to you, what do they do next? Something happens to who? To you. Y'all trying to kill me? What is happening? <laughs> well, if you work with me, I, it's not just me. Um, I have a law partner and I have staff. So well, SR Law will continue. Also, you get your originals. We don't keep those. Um, so you will have the, whatever, you will have the documents um, that you need to, 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 to go forward. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I that will not funny. prevent you from, you know, if you do planning with me, you, you, you will have everything you need and we are done. Um, so you won't even need me anymore. All right. Well, thank you so much for your expertise. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Talk to you soon.